Americans, I thank you all once again for the opportunity to stand before you and to advocate not only for the people of the beautiful state of South Carolina, but for the people of this nation as a whole. Before I begin with the topic at hand for today, I wish to quickly address my credibility on these matters in terms of the nickname which my companion, Charles Pinckney, so chose to draw up out of my past. I was, for a time, referred to by my constituents of South Carolina as Dictator John, a name that now, in light of the war that we fought and the ideals this nation embodied in doing so, paints me in the light of a radical at best, a tyrant at worst. While serving as governor, I came to face the task of organizing our limited resources towards the goal of driving out unlawful British occupation. Circumstances are, as the gentlemen of this convention are well aware, of utmost importance in the decision of what brand of leadership and what forms of government are most suitable for a body of people. Times of war are fraught with uncertainty, and so when my people asked me for direction and stability, I took the headstrong and determined position to fill that role. After the war had been won and the British cast out, let it be noted that I abdicated my position of unchecked power and reassigned myself to a position within the legislature. So, to those among us, wary of the corrupting nature of power and influence on men within a strong central government, remember myself as an example of one who has the experience and sense to stand firmly when necessary and to step back accordingly. I return now to the purpose of my time before this convention, which is to address the topics of taxation and representation in terms of slavery in this country. It is my firm position, on behalf of my constituents in South Carolina, that representation be based on quotas of contribution, and that taxation on such representation based on property should be limited at the very greatest to that of equal amounts. I quote our esteemed delegate, Mr. John Adams, in his assertion that the numbers of people were taken by this article as an index of the wealth of the state and not as subjects of taxation that as to this matter it was of no consequence by what name you called your people, whether by that of freemen or of slaves, that in some countries the laboring poor were called freemen, in others they were called slaves, but that the difference as to the state was imaginary only, and that it is the number of laborers which produce the surplus for taxation, and numbers, therefore, indiscriminately, are the fair index of wealth. As these are separate states joined to form one perfect union, just as women and children who are ill-equipped to civically engage in our system but yet are counted in the districts determining representation, so must the slaves inhabiting our southern states, for they are determinant of the wealth of our farmers, our states, and the wealth and resources of this nation. The slave-owning states among us will be required to pay a tax to the government for the representation of their slaves in the legislature, but this representation shall not exceed the rate on which said taxation will be based. The possibility of a clause for the representation of less than the total amount of slaves in a state is negotiable, and in an endeavor to reach a state of harmony within this convention, a rate of three-fifths for the counting and representation of slaves in the legislature, as is supported by a few of our colleagues, or somewhere thereabouts, would be a fine and just solution as well. Join me, sirs, in the protection of the right to proper representation that many of us fought so bravely for in our revolution, and the firm establishment of a secure nation. Thank you.